So the text that we're reading, and uh, those of you who want to seriously study the Theravada, the Maurice Walsh translation, even though I object to so much about these translations, but I'll do about all of them, um, he did a translation and uh, published by Wisdom Publications. And then more recently, the sort of updated uh, version of that, or later edition of that, is called The Long Discourses of the Buddha. And uh, it has a green cover and so on. I, I didn't bring the book because I have it on the computer. But uh, I have a scan on the computer. But um, So those of you who want to read that, I, I don't feel good about putting online the scan of the guy's book, you know. So I didn't put it online. But maybe I could pick out a couple of sutras and put, like the Samanapala one that I read last time, I should probably put that for those who want to read it and they don't have access to the book. But um, uh, that wonderful sutra that we read before, the Samanapala Sutta, the uh, sutra of the fruits of the homeless life, as he translates it, or I would call it the, the fruits of being a seeker. Uh, dis discourse, sutta means dis sutta means discourse in uh, in Buddhism, and uh, so that's it. I think we're not on yet, are we? Hello, everybody. Oh, lots of people showed up. How are you? Hello. Good. So we're going to look today at the sutta. Well, but first, maybe I will start. Yes, it is seven o'clock. First, I will start. I, the previous uh, lecture was supposed to be about Buddhist science, but I launched right into the Samanapala Sutta, pretty much. And I didn't talk my usual talk about Buddhist science, which, uh, which I'll just do, and I, although I talked about it in the process of reading from the Sutta. So, um, and I want to read another Sutta, the third one, and several others tonight. But let me just have a short time first to talk about Buddhist science. The reason I make a fuss about Buddhist science. And uh, supposedly, you know, there has been a dialogue with His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Western scientists for many years. The first such meeting was actually organized by me, but not in the organization of the mind and life. It just had Amherst College when I was there in 1984. Then they found that they were, some of the people, members, went on to found the, uh, the Mind and Life Organization in 1987, and they started having meetings, and we had lots more meetings, which was great. And, uh, but uh, one of my complaints there is that mostly the Western scientists do all the talking, and the Dalai Lama makes some comments, and they occasionally ask a question, and they're very inspired by his comments and questions, but basically, they don't really think there is such a thing as Buddhist science, so they don't really have a dialogue. You know, it's just like the Dalai Lama's sort of critiques of some of their more, more incoherent ideas and his appreciation of all their wonderful inventions and discoveries and so forth, because the Buddhist tradition really likes the material sciences. Not the dogma of materialism, we don't like that at all, but we consider that an unnecessary dogma, although it has enabled them to produce tremendous discoveries and results and things like that, which is really excellent. We're not at all against that. And we're not at all against this. Not only are we not against the scientific method, as outlined by Karl Popper, let's say the most definitive version of it lately, uh, which is that all so-called laws of nature, all theories, are hypotheses that take account of whatever evidence has been accumulated in experiment or you could say experience. Experiments are, after all, experiences, uh, measurement experiences, but they are experiences. Uh, but they are just hypotheses in the sense that they are awaiting falsification. Oh, you have a copy of the long discourses, good for you. They are awaiting falsification uh, by further experience, further evidence, further experiments. So they're not dogmas. There can be no absolute law of nature as a dogma, in other words. And uh, this was Popper's, Karl Popper, who the Dalai Lama actually met, uh, was his sort of philosophy of science, sort of theory of what the scientific method is. So the scientific method, in other words, is open-minded, always acknowledging that experience slash experiment supersedes theory. And theory is just accounting for and trying to explain 
experience and experiment. And therefore, there is no final theory, at least not yet. If that's the scientific method, then Buddha preceded that by 2,500 years by saying that, and that was also formulated, I always like to mention the Copenhagen Declaration and what some people call the Copenhagen Interpretation, uh, which was 1926 by quantum physicists. Uh, it was uh, you know, proposed or propounded by Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg, two quantum physicists in Copenhagen. And Einstein was present and all the sort of biggies of the time were there. And they said that uh, quantum experience had shown that deep reality, what they, and they used the word deep, which I think was really interesting, that deep reality was unsusceptible to theorization and could not be captured by conceptualization or mathematics or could not be grabbed with certainty because at the micro level, observe, the process of observing a natural phenomenon interfered with the natural phenomenon. And therefore, the subjectivity of the observer was part of, the, of any data. And therefore, it was subjective. And it was not, it, there's no such thing, therefore, in a way, of, at the deep reality level as a sort of absolute objective reality. That was their pronouncement. But that was not the death knell of empirical science, even materialist science, because they were saying, therefore, we can only work with probabilities at the surface level of reality, of what we can observe of reality, and we, and we can you know, predict things, and we can observe and measure things, and so forth, and we can make progress with that experimentally, even with, but by keeping theories open, and in a way, the sort of ultimate statement of the openness of theories is that at the deepest level, the reductionistic, having reductionist people having reached the deepest level of observation had realized that you, there's, no, there's no deep reality as an objective thing that you've captured uh, with your, your interpretation of your observation, let's say, right? So mind actually, as Gregory Bateson used to say, the great uh, anthropologist Gregory, and theorist Gregory Bateson used to say, the late Gregory Bateson used to say, Mind has re-entered nature as something to be contended with. But, um, and here I follow the, a physicist, a well-known senior physicist named Henry Stapp. But at that Copenhagen meeting, a majority of the physicists, even quantum ones, rebelled against that proposal. And, and the rebellion was actually led by a non-quantum physicist, namely Einstein and that famous statement of his that God does not play dice. Uh, it was sort of the thing it's known by. And I never quite realized that was, an, he was because he was not a quantum physicist, but I didn't realize that that created a split in the world of quantum, quantum physicists between the theorists and the empiricists. And the theorists got way off out the deep end beyond the kind of thing that could be falsified or verified like 11 dimensions, string theory, which are mathematical beauty, beautiful things. But, but um, as the quantum physicist uh, Glashow at Harvard said in a film made by Brian Greene, uh, these are not really, they can't take this seriously because you can't, there's no experimental way of either proving or disproving these theories. You know, they're like we 11 dimensions, they're way beyond anything that you can prove. They're pure, pure structure of inferences that go on and on, you know. And what Stapp said that really stopped me in my tracks a couple of years ago when I heard him say that, he said that, and the result of this split is <clears throat> that the theorists have been come to be considered irrelevant by the practicing quantum physicists. And they don't really pay attention. I mean, they sort of read about it or something. They meet them at a conference, but <clears throat> they don't really think it has really much to do with their physical work with physical things, you know, in their labs, you know. And they, they are still, in a way, accepting the Copenhagen uh, Declaration in 1926, which is the Buddhist scientific declaration. The Buddhist scientific declaration is that emptiness, what emptiness means is relativity, actually. Emptiness does not mean, and this is the same for Theravada or Mahayana, 
<coughs> but it's not elaborated quite so thoroughly in Theravada. But emptiness does not mean a kind of a void space somewhere, because any void space somewhere itself is also empty of any intrinsic reality of itself as a void space. So a void space is simply full of all the things. So emptiness me simply means that everything is relational only. There's no non-relational component in anything. And therefore, everything is empty of any non-relational essence or non-relational component. So it isn't actually a discovery of nothingness or, or a, a real void somewhere, unless this is considered a real void, where we are here with like both, both hands clapping, the two skin surfaces meeting and making a sound. That's voidness. That's the space. That's what it is. It's not like there's a void inside that or something or beyond that or this disappears. There's an experience where I can be looking at my hand in a state of certain state of concentration and the hand will disappear and my sense of a subjective visual consciousness will disappear. And uh, that, but that experience is not the void because that experience, it seems like a space or a void. It's called it's called the space-like equipoised samadhi, or concentration, and it's considered a valuable and a liberating experience, but it's not the destination of nirvana or the void or something that you reached reality when you do that. You just simply have seen the relativity of all the seemingly differentiated things, and you come into a thing which is an experience of non-differentiated, non-differentiation, and everything disappears into it. Uh, which is a little different than just uh, being unconscious. It's like you're consciously in a, where everything has disappeared. Your consciousness becomes the disappearance, let's say. And, um, but that's not the void. That's not voidness. That's not emptiness. So, so therefore, emptiness means this is just, everything is just a relativity. And that relativity, actually, all theories that describe the processes of that relativity, are themselves relative and contextual, and they are valid or invalid, useful or non-useful within specific contexts in regard to people making sense of their experience and predicting you know, how to ameliorate their experience or whatever they might do with it. But none of them are final, and none of them can be absolute dogmas. But in a way, the one absolute dogma is the lack of absolute dogmas, <laughs> which is a negation. It's an opening, that's all. You know, so that forces, it forces the mind to remain open and have no conceptual capturing of things. And the experience of disappearing is not a capturing of the things. It's just a temporary corrective. One Lama I know made the most brilliant thing about it. He said that, he said that we have wrongly wrapped all our experience of relative things around a misknowledge, a misperception that each relative thing has a non-relative essence to it. So in other words, we don't just see the floor, we see the real floor. And it has a sense of intrinsic objectivity, intrinsic uh, reality, intrinsic identity to us as the real floor. And that excessive investment of the real about it is a distortion which it is empty of. There is no the real in the floor, it's just the relative floor. So it's sort of a little bit unreal, it's a sort of illusory floor. It seems like the real one, but it's just the regular one. Something like that, it's as subtle as that, right? So the experience of it all disappeared. So we've been wrapped together in that misknowledge for so long that when we investigate things at a deep level, subject and object, to seek that seeming reality of all those things, they all seem to disappear under analysis. And the last place that we could invest with this sort of real reality would be the state of the disappearance. But that would be a trap, and that would be a big mistake. Do you follow? Because that experience itself is empty of being intrinsically real. It's still only because it, we enter it and exit it, you know. It, it's, although it seems like it's, the, it's always been there or something, it's actually... Uh, it's actually a constructed thing in the sense that it's the opposite of what we're used to. So the sort of intrinsic reality habit that we have about regular differentiated things attaches itself to the relational experience of all those things 
disappearing and losing their sense of intrinsic reality. And then, so the last thing is we think, well, this is really real. Is what's really real is that all of them being disappeared. And when I experienced that, I'm, I became enlightened. And then I think I'm sort of something great. So that's a mistake, actually. So, uh, so that's so. Therefore, uh, in this, in the, according to the method of science, the Buddha's whole movement and his teaching and his own feeling of well-being, his own feeling of release and liberation, came not from believing in something, but from experiencing something. And that something is reality itself, in the sense of a, of a sort of infinite, vast, relative reality in which all things are totally interrelated, which he experienced. And, uh, and therefore, it was kind of like a scientific result. He took the measure of reality. It all disappeared. And even the state of its disappearance disappeared. And there he was, sort of with a sense of being one with everything without sort of grasping onto anything. And that feeling of being free there without grasping uh, was experienced as a blissful release. And, and, and that bliss was such that he experienced everything as, as being that sufficiency, freedom, um, you know, and, and lack of any kind of, lacking anything, you know, lack of lack. So therefore, blissful, fulfilled, or something like that. But anyway, of course, all those words I'm using to describe it are all words used for dualistic description, so none of them are really perfect. They're just vectors of the whole thing. That was, uh, that was somehow, that was his openness, but therefore it was a discovery. It was the discovery of relativity. It was a physical discovery also, because it was the nature not only of ment not only physical things, but also mental things. So it was both physical and mental discovery. And, uh, but it was therefore physics. And it, was pre it predicted the result that was come up that, that was subsequently arrived at 2,500 approximately years later by the, by the quantum physicists, by the experimental quantum physicists, in which, which the theoretical ones are fleeing because the people who haven't fully experienced that, but who have sort of skirted it, automatically think that it's kind of nihilistic, they feel frightened, they feel they're not going to be able to control the world and the universe from their sort of self-centered point of view, and they feel that's the only point of view they could ever possibly have, and they don't feel safe if they can't control everything around them. So that sort of unscientific aspect that has trapped current modern materialistic and reductionist scientists and prevented them from opening to dealing with the intersubjective and interobjective world where the mind is part of it. Um, that's where they're stuck, kind of, you know. And uh, whatever prowess they have of detecting black holes colliding and doing this and doing that is all to the good, actually. But they're, they're limited to how they can use that to benefit human beings because they're running around with the sort of dogmatic assertion that they're not there that they don't have a consciousness, that they're, someday they'll get, figure out their consciousness when they have reduced the brain to neurons and the neurons to atoms and the atoms to subatomic indivisible particles or strings that they'll finally capture in some way. Then they'll know what their mind is because it'll be reduced to a material object, but then they obviously haven't been able to find that and uh, actually never will because their mind will also dissolve under analysis. Just like thing, matter has dissolved under analysis, they would experience it dissolving under analysis, but they're frightened of that because they feel it's sort of chaos, you know, chaos will ensue. You know? so, so that was Buddha's fundamental discovery of the nature of the physical and mental world. And therefore, and, and therefore, and therefore, since he was a human being and yet discovered that experientially himself, something that he couldn't formulate in a theory, but he could provide a method where people could break past all the theories that have them trapped into sort of forcing the world to fit with their conviction about the world. He, he developed a method that could enable others to use that path of ultimately pure negation to ex experience that liberating experience themselves. And then millions of people over the centuries followed that method and did so experience it. But it was an educational process that they did. It wasn't a mystical thing. It wasn't because they believed in nirvana or something. It was uh, because they 
had a method of examining the mind and the physical reality as well, mental and physical reality, which ultimately may not be even be divisible into such a division, which doesn't mean, though, that the physical is to be privileged over the mental. You can reduce either one in either direction once they're the same thing, actually, in fact. So, uh, so that was his first. And then the second was he elaborated certain theories about the relative world in a scientific manner. And this is one of my favorite things, where he, uh, he elaborated a theory of biology that has some resemblance to Darwin's theory in the sense that he certainly discerned by, again, direct experience, the relationship of the human being and the animal existence and the insect and then other beings that we nowadays don't consider to exist, you know, divine beings, demonic beings. Uh, and he experienced all of that. And he saw that this was just a kind of a gamut, an evolutionary gamut. And within that, reaching the divine level was not the goal because that was still another you know, ignorance-driven form of being. And even, in fact, gods become very egotistical because they're powerful, more powerful than humans. But they're, they're not omnipotent, none of them. And, um, and yet you can come and go. It becomes like a circle, like a wheel, you know. And the human form is actually human, and certain divine forms are the best because one's aware of one's impermanence and one's aware of the suffering, potential suffering, and how much worse it can be and one is aware of one's you know, danger of being reborn, driven by negative emotion and negative ideation and so forth. And, but so the human one is, has the best motive, and the best opportunity, the, the adequate uh, instruments of understanding to become aware of the nature of the reality. And once they become aware of it, they become contented and blissful and happy and able to maneuver within it, actually, uh, in a way beneficial to, the, to themselves and others. So that, that biologic, that's the theory of karma, in other words. And I argue that karma is a secular biological theory, in, which, is, uh, which he elaborated to contradict the Vedic theory of control of the universe by the gods, which was the prevailing religious theory in his time. So he created a rational, causal, evolutionary, and biological theory, and that's the second kind of science. And then he had psychology and whatever it was, architecture, art, you know, language, linguistics. All of that was invented in ancient India. In linguistics, in case Westerners think we're so bright, we invented, we came up with the concept German and Russian scholars started the process of the science of linguistics uh, upon discovery of the Sanskrit language, actually. The ancient Greek didn't have a concept of linguistics. They did not have a scientific grammar. And uh, although they have a grammar very similar to Sanskrit, but uh, the Sanskrit uh, linguists in the 2,500, 2,400, 500 years ago uh, completely got into the generative theory of language way ahead of Chomsky or whatever, you know, long back. And we caught up with that sort of, sort of. Although I think Chomsky is, he has the problem, he doesn't think animals have language which is incorrect from Buddhist scientific point of view. But that's a side sort. Okay, so that was roughly, I mean, I have a more elaborate way of talking about it and about how the, you know, the Buddhists, you know, the Hindus of the time really were kind of like the creationists today in that they didn't want to have been reborn as a monkey in the past or as a, as a bacteria or as an insect or something. They didn't want to be, have the danger of being reborn that way in the future. And uh, so they wanted to think that God was in charge, and as long as they worshipped God or the gods, they had both monotheistic and polytheistic versions in India, which was a huge, you know, huge place even then. Uh, but uh, it was contradicting that, you know, the human being is embedded in the biology. The animal world is embedded in a larger biology going all the way from hell to heaven, and many layers of heaven, anyway. So anyway, that's, that was my, that's my thing on Buddhist science, okay? So it's on that basis that the Buddha tangles with the people in his society. And we read last time the Samanapala, which is sort of one of the Ur Sutras of the... And you'll see if you read in the later thing in that book, in many places they say, look at Sutta number two, paragraph so-and-so and so-and-so, because 
that becomes like a stark description of the stages leading to nirvana, you know, for them. And so they doesn't repeat that in the other suttas. But I wanted to look today at a few of the Buddha's social suttas, you know, uh, with you. And that's what we're going to do. And I apologize. This painting makes it difficult for you to read the bottom part when this thing comes back to life. Hello. There it is. Aha. Thus have I heard at one upon a certain occasion. <laughs> <coughs> You know, thus did I hear on a certain occasion, and I described to you, so I won't go, won't go back over that, why that is important and it, it, as the symbol of the authenticity of, a, of, a, of the reportage of a discourse of the Buddhas. And it shouldn't be once like that. It should be, thus did I hear on a certain occasion, period. Then the Lord, or the Bhagavan, the Blessed Lord, the Blissful Lord, or whatever, was touring Kosala with a large number of monks, etc., so then he came to a Kosalan Brahmin village called Ich, and these are not monks also, which is, makes them sound religious. These are mendicants. So these are scholarship students and faculty, basically. Mendicant means someone who lives on a free lunch, which this wealthy society offered to people seeking enlightenment, you know, unlike our university system, <laughs> where we have... $1.3 trillion of student debt at the moment, and the faculty always live in a little bit of debt unless they are economists who can moonlight to corporations uh, or some natural scientists who get a patent or something. Otherwise, they are not wealthy people. So, but these are mendicants, and, and the mendicant simply means that they are able to spend their entire main focus of life, if you will, their profession, seeking the nature of reality. And, uh, they're in, and they're so intent upon that that they're willing to live as celibate, either female or male. They're willing to live without a home. They're called homeless on purpose. But the people offer them shelter, of course, freely, because they're on a lifelong scholarship. They have like a, a, they're like lifelong MacArthur fellowships, all of them, these mendicants. You know? And the Buddha was able to institute that because of the wealth of the society, because of his social standing before he became a, became a, a Buddha, a mendicant himself. And uh, it has to do with the greatness and the wisdom of the Indian civilization at this time, which no Greek king or upper class would offer to its citizens. No Chinese one either at this time at all. And you don't even have the religious form of this, which we, we could call monasticism, until the in the Mediterranean world, about 300 of the common era, two, 300 of the common era, and in other words, 700, 700 to 800 years after this time in India, and same in China. They don't really have mendicants in China until around third century of the common era. And in Confucius, who was an enlightened, an axial age or enlightened teacher of his time in China, but he couldn't get even scholarships, for, he couldn't get even a job himself as a faculty member of some duke his, in his region where he lived, and he couldn't have it. There was no support for his students, few students that he was able to have in his house, because he didn't have a school. And Toynbee points this out, that the, that the Indian economy sustained, with its surpluses and its wealth, it sustained these seekers at a, at a, much, greater, uh, a much greater level. Okay, so a large number of mendicants, some 500, and he came to a Kosal and Brahmin village. And the Brahmins are the one of the high castes, they try to pretend that they were the highest, always, but actually the warrior the royal class was the highest, and the Brahmins kind of worked for them. But they were intellectuals, and they were educated, and they also were priests, so they had an importance of interceding to the gods in the local religion to make people's lives go well. So the upper class people, therefore, honored them, and they had a livelihood of serving as priests for the people. You know. So he came to this place called Icha Nankala. And he stayed in the dense jungle of Icha Nankala. At that time, the Brahmin Pokhara Sati was living in Ukata, a populous place full of grass, timber, water, and corn. Grain, I think. I don't know. They didn't have corn. I don't know why they do that. The corn was distributed from the Americas by the British in the 18th, 17th century. And they didn't have corn in India. Why has to say corn? Grain is the word, which had been given to him by King Pasanadi of Kosala as a royal gift and with royal powers, which means that 
that the king there had dedicated the tax yield of a certain number of fields to the support of uh, this Brahmin, Pokharasati, as a priest. You know, he, he, this was his endowment, you could say. It doesn't mean that the people in the village were his slaves. They were not. They were free. They had like a 6 to 10 percent uh, portion of whatever the yield of their fields was calculated to be, which was the Indian village, very wonderful village system, actually. Anyway, but they, although there were some slaves in the cities, there, were, there was slavery an institution at this time, but it was not a major one, and the villagers were not, uh, mainstream villagers were not uh, slaves. But they were uh, not accepted as the three higher castes, on the other hand, mostly, except the owners, like that Brahmin, you know. So he, he heard people say, the ascetic Gotama, which the word ascetic is actually seeker Gotama, son of the Sakyans, who has gone forth from the Sakya clan, Shakya clan, actually, we say in Sanskrit, is staying in the jungle. And concerning that, blessed Lord, a good report has been spread about. He's an arahat. Arahat means one who has destroyed his inner enemy of ignorance and greed and hatred, and therefore is enlightened at some, to some degree, but <clears throat> not necessarily a Buddha, type of enlightened person, but not quite the full-scale Buddha, even, in the, even for the Theravada. A fully enlightened Buddha, because they, they're Samyak, Sam Buddha, that's different as Arhat, but he also, of course, is an Arhat. Perfected in knowledge and conduct. The word conduct is literally wisdom and feet. By conduct, they mean feet. He has perfect wisdom and perfect feet, meaning he behaves well. So therefore, they translate conduct. Uh, a welfarer, which is not, he is on welfare, he lives on a free lunch. But the word sugata doesn't mean welfarer. It, sugata means sukamgata, one who has realized bliss. Sukha means bliss. So a blissful one is what it should be translated as, even in Theravada. It's not a welfarer, he's a blissful one. Knower of, of worlds, so he knows the world also, he knows the relative world, that means. He has knowledge all about the world. Unequal tamer of men to be tamed. And uh, the <clears throat> this is a wonderful phrase, actually, in the sense that an excessively egocentric person is considered untamed, wild, because they're just out for themselves. They're just an appetite. You know, they want something. And they use other people that way. And they th think other people are like that with them, so they're aggressive also and they're fighting off other people, and they're trying to dominate other people, and they're considered like a wild person. A tamed person is considered one whose own ego is under their own control, and they, it's not that they don't have an ego. Uh, they do, but they, um, they don't have a, a sort of absolute ego, and therefore they have come to feel that other beings are, as they're in a world in relation with other beings, and they, other beings also have interests, and they have to like kind of negotiate the interest, and they're, they're not just wildly grabbing for what they want, and maybe pretending to care about other people, but actually just out for themselves completely. So that, that's considered, in, in the Buddhist psychology, untamed person. You could translate it, uneducated even, you could translate it as. So they're an equal educator of humans, Humans to be educated, you could translate it. But he, he leaves the tame to be literal. Um, vinita, that means, you know, there's one who can be led away. Vinita, like a horse, a tame horse, you can put the bridle and you can lead it somewhere, you know. It isn't just going to jump and buck and just do what it wants. And, uh, and trainer, you know, teacher, you know, of humans to be tame. Teacher of gods and humans, that's a very important. This is Theravada, remember? Remember my, one of my things I'm refuting and teaching about Theravada in these first weeks is this idea that Theravada is all very humanistic and very naturalistic and there's no, nothing super normal or what modern materialists would say supernatural. You know, there's tons of supernormal stuff. In fact, nature includes the life form of deities, angels, demons, goblins, all kinds of creatures, in fact. And this totally in the Theravada, not just in the Mahayana, is my point. A Buddha, a blessed Lord, that's a Bhagavan, you know, a fortunate one. That blessed means has great fortune. He proclaims uh, 
this world with its gods, I mean, he proclaims, he teaches, he can describe this world with its gods, devils, Mara means devil. Brahma is a, Brahma is a type of God, the very highest type who some people in this world at this time considered a creator God. The world of ascetics and Brahmins, that's seekers and priests. Uh, seekers and priests, if you ascetics and Brahmins means, with its princes and people, having come to know it in its beginning, know it by his own knowledge. In other words, he directly knew. It isn't that he believes this, or he's following that theory, or this ancient scripture, or this revelation from some god. He knew it himself, the nature of the world. He came to know the nature of the world. And therefore he teaches a dharma, and a dhamma in Pali, and Dhamma comes from the root dr to hold, and it means, therefore, before Buddha's time, although actually I discovered maybe 10 years ago, for years I didn't know this, there's a great uh, translator, a Sri Lankan Christian gentleman who works at the University of Texas, although he may have retired now, great translator of Buddhist texts, um, and Sanskrit texts, actually, mostly, not Pali, uh, named Patrick Olivelle. And he said that in all of his study of the pre-Buddhist Indian literature, the Vedas, the Brahmanas, the Aranyakas, the Upanishads, the use, he discovered in all that he read in that, which of course is millions of works like that, but he read you know, hundreds, thousands, I'm sure, he only found 17 uses of the word dharma. It's kind of interesting, because we think of it today, and in Hinduism today it's like a most common word. Actually, in India today, law school means dharma school. Um, dharma also means religion. Uh, dharma in Buddhism has a, the, the Buddhist master of the 5th century, 4th and 5th century, Vasubandhu, great scholar, he, he said there were 11 major meanings of dharma, coming from the verb to hold. And of those, Buddha made the one that was opposite to the earlier one. The earlier one is what, uh, what sociologists call pattern-maintaining type of meaning, where dharma means, you know, law, custom, duty, you know, habit even, something that holds the behavior of people in certain patterns. And even at the phenomenal level, a dhamma can be a thing, like a table. And the, a table holds its own distinguishing characteristic. It's a solakshana dharanatiti dharmaha. It's like the, the, the sort of most basic meaning of dharma in Buddhist thought. So like a table, the table dharma means that it has four legs and the surface and whatever, you know, you can put something on it. You know, and of course, in a non-Buddhist sense, they would think it has a table essence that it instantiates, you know, someone who had an essentialist theory of reality. So Dhamma has those meanings, but Buddha changed the meaning and he said, no, Dhamma, what holds us at the highest level is reality itself. And he redefined it to mean that which holds us in freedom from suffering. So it also is a synonym of nirvana of ultimate reality, of that, which means actual reality, the, the deep level of what is really here and there. Uh, it means also the teaching about what that reality is, so that's, in other words, the method of someone coming to try to understand it. It also means action in conformity with what is reality, that is to say virtuous and pos what we consider virtuous and positive and helpful and useful action, and evolutionarily, with the evolutionarily positive outcome. Those are called dharma. And similarly, an adharma, a non-dharma, is like some negative, harmful thing like killing people and, and stealing and lying, and etc. And uh, so all of these pattern transcending type of meanings are what Buddha gave it at greater emphasis, but they, he still kept, of course. He, therefore, he transvalued the term to fit with his new insight about the nature of reality, but that leaving intact the older use of the term. So, for example, if you have studied Hinduism, some of you, and you know about the Bhagavad Gita, when Krishna, much later, is talking to Arjuna that he has to fight in the battle because it's his dharma as a warrior, that means it's his duty, custom, and it's the Hindu religion that a warrior is supposed to fight. 
It doesn't mean the dharma of liberation and moksha, because he, he, Krishna, I mean, Arjuna doesn't want to fight. He says, forget about it. I'm not going to kill my cousins and teachers just because there's one bad egg among them. If out of vengeance and slaughter all these many people, I'm not going to do it. And uh, Krishna says, no, no, you have to do it because it's your dharma with there. It means pattern maintaining your duty. It's your nature as a warrior. You have to do it and so forth, he said. And uh, so that word dharma is very important. So he teaches a dhamma, which means a teaching that is lovely in its beginning, lovely in its middle, and lovely in its ending. So how is it lovely in its beginning? Because Buddha experienced nirvana, freedom from suffering, you know, the bliss of reality, as it were, sitting under the Bodhi tree that day, and, uh, and, and pro pronounced that, that this is the destination, this is the possibility, this is the reality that everyone already has, actually, if they knew it, but the ignorance prevents them from experiencing it. Their mis misperception and misknowledge makes them think they're suffering and struggling and all this, and they really are, because they don't know the reality. So, but it's lovely that at least one hears that, gee, everything in its reality is actually fine, and it's free of suffering, it's blissful, which is what he actually announced. You know, the door, the door to nirvana is open and so forth. He was conservative in announcing it because he knew that suffering people, especially certain kind of high caste males, Brahmins and warriors, would, would dismiss as ridiculous if he just said, oh, it's all bliss actually already. They would say, forget, what are you talking about? You know, I'll just cut my hand, you know, or something. It's not bliss at all, you know. So he, he just said the cessation of suffering and he let them think it was something they had to get to somewhere else at first, which is Theravada. They're getting to some place that's elsewhere. He let them think that. Because that, that seemed then possibly, still unrealistic actually to most people, but poss a possibility at least. Whereas if he hit them with the deeper teaching right away that actually Nirvana's here, and um, although he was announcing it in his presence in a way, you could say, you know, because he was in it and he was feeling it and he was therefore radiating bliss himself. Therefore, he's a sugata, a sukham gata, a blissful one, a bhagavan, one, a fortunate one, etc. You know, all those names of Buddha. So there's lovely in the beginning, lovely in its middle, because if people take pick up on it and decide, well, as far as I'm concerned, life sucks, and I'm having a really frustrating time with it. But maybe I should try out this guy. He seems cool, and you know, it makes sense what he has to say to some extent at least, so maybe I should inquire into it, and when I start looking into it and start thinking about what is really the nature of this self of mine that I obey at all times, its impulses, maybe it's not really, they're not absolutely binding on me, maybe I can rethink this and that impulse, and they immediately start to feel better, and they have a more harmonious life around them and so forth. So that's lovely in its middle, and of course lovely in its ending is the realization of Nirvana, of freedom from suffering, and that's quite lovely. So it is so lovely, beginning, middle, and end. It it, uh, it works out, if if unless everyone's crazy in the tradition, which they might be. I grant you. Uh, and he displays the fully perfected, thoroughly purified, holy life. That's his own way of living. Um, and people gravitated to him in droves, etc. And he ruined whole countries by accepting people as mendicants. Um, in the sense of grew in the defense forces of his own country and many others. And indeed, it is good to see such arhats, such, uh, such saints, actually. I think the best word for arhat is saint. The English word saint means one who comes from sanos, to be pure or clean. And it means they cleanse themselves of negative man's mental states. And so oh, that's what arhat, but they don't, use, they don't use the purity, impurity so much. They do use that language in Buddhism, but Ari means the enemy, and Hant means the destroyer of the enemy. So he just they destroyed that inner enemy of the misknowing, misunderstanding person. You know, indeed, it's good to see such arhats. So then, this Pokara Sati, Rasati, who was um, that line on top of a vowel makes give it emphasis and a length to the vowel, like Pokara Sati. You go like that. He had a pupil, the youth Ambatta, who was a student who was a student of the Vedas who knew the mantras. Here, mantra means the Vedic uh, verses, perfected in the three Vedas, 
That's the Rig Veda, the Yajur Veda, and the Sama Veda. A skilled expounder of the rules and rituals, the lore of sounds and meanings, that's linguistics. And, the, and fifthly, oral tradition, that's the teachings of his teacher, complete in philosophy and in the marks of a great man. And these are some sort of physical signs of sort of a very evolutionarily developed person. So Ambata was quite a developed person, actually, that means, by his previous life's karma, which have there some weird properties of such a person, the marks, but I'm not going to get into that now. Admitted, which is also not at all naturalistic in modern materialist terms, that, that, that there are such kind of bodies. You know. Admitted and accepted by his master in the three Vedas with the words, what I know you know, what you know I know. So in other words, he was a graduate of Pokarasati, Ambata was. So Pokarasati is a little chicken himself to go see Buddha. He senses maybe Buddha might be more of a match for him. So he sends Ambata. He says, Ambata, my son, the seeker Gotama, and I'm sorry that I know you have trouble seeing this, you can only really see at the top, you know. The seeker Gotama, um, I, you know, I'm editing as I read, so the ascetic Gotama, is staying in the dense jungle of Ichanangkala, and concerning that blessed Lord, he uses the term, a good report has been spread about. Now you go to see the, the seeker Gotama and find out whether this report is correct or not, and whether the reverend Gotama is as they say or not, in that way we shall put the Reverend Gotama to the test. So he's going to evaluate, which is a good thing to do, he's going to evaluate the teacher Gotama, Shakyamuni, you know, uh, to see if he's a proper Buddha, a pro properly enlightened person. He's suspecting him because, remember, uh, Shakyamuni is of the Kshatriya class, the warrior class, he's not a Brahmin. Sir, how shall I find out? And then he asks him, how shall I do it? I'm going to compress because I don't want to take the whole time on this one sutra. So he says, how shall I do it if he has the 32 marks of a great man, if he lives the household life, if he, he would become a ruler, a wheel-turning monarch, conqueror of four quarters, etc. And he, he lists even the things he's using, Vedic, ancient Indian cultural knowledge, talks about the seven, the seven treasures of a ruler, of a, of a special an emperor, sort of, he has more than a thousand sons, he dwells having conquered the land, blah, blah, blah. But if he goes from the household life into homelessness, then he will become an arhat, a Buddha, who draws back the veil from the world. And Ambata, I am the passer on of the mantras and you are the receiver. So he gives him what to look for, in other words. So then Ambata, so it means it even that this Brahmin has the, in his mind the possibility of someone becoming enlightened, which is, that's good. <clears throat> so he goes up and went there, got into his whole chariot, he got into his BMW, and uh, he's a wealthy young man, and um, headed for the dense jungle, and he drove as far as that would go. Then he continued on foot, because the Buddha was in a dense jungle with his monks. So then at that time, a monk, number of monks were walking up and down in the open air, and Ambata approached them and said, where is the Reverend Gotama to be found? I've come to see Reverend Gotama. So they thought, well, he's a youth of good family and a pupil of the distinguished Brahmin. And uh, I guess the Buddha wouldn't mind talking with him. So they said, well, go over there. That little hut is his dwelling with the door closed. Go quietly up to it and go onto the veranda without haste, the porch there, cough, and knock on the bolt. I don't know if it was really a veranda or just the sort of seating area in front of it. Knock on the bolt. The Lord will open the door to you. So he went there, and he knocked and coughed, and the Buddha opened the door. And then the Ambata had some young Brahmins with him, and they entered, exchanged courtesies, and sat down. But Ambata walked up and down while the Lord sat there, uttering some vague words of politeness, and then stood so, speaking before the seated Lord, which is uh, against the uh, etiquette. He doesn't sit down. And the Lord said to Ambata, well now Ambata, would you behave like this if you were talking to venerable and learned Brahmin teachers, teachers of teachers, as you do with me, walking and standing while I am sitting and uttering vague words of politeness? Uh, no, Reverend Gautama, a Brahmin should walk with a walking Brahmin, stand with a standing Brahmin, sit with a sitting Brahmin, lie down with a Brahmin who is lying down. But as for these shaven little seekers, menials, black scourings from Brahma's foot, with them it is fitting to speak just as I do with the Reverend Gautama. Now he's not saying Gautama himself is not a Kshatriya, 
but he knows that there are many of the, of the ascetics, of the mendicants with the Buddha, are from the untouchable castes, you know. So they're from the feet of the god, you know. And he, sh he can't sit down among them, you know. That's, he's really uptight about his class, you know, his caste. So then, um, so then, then Buddha says, well, Ambata, you came here seeking something. Whatever it was you came for, you should listen attentively to hear about it. But Ambata, you have not perfected your training. Your conceit of being trained is due to nothing but inexperience. So Buddha can be a bit critical with people. That's what I wanted you all to see. He's not always like, oh yeah, that's great. Then Ambata was angry and displeased at being called untrained or uneducated. It's much better if he would just say that, this guy. But they, th they don't think they have education in India or something. And he turned on the Lord with curses and insults. And he was thinking, oh, this, this seeker Gautama bears me ill will. And he said, Reverend Gautama, the seconds are fierce, rough-spoken, touchy, and violent. Being of menial origin, being menials, they do not honor, respect, esteem, and revere, pay homage to Brahmins. With regard to this, it is not proper what they do, that they do not pay homage to Brahmins. So then he accused the seconds of being menials. And then Buddha says, well, but Ambata, what have the seconds done to you? Because he is from Shakya, right? He's, he doesn't really identify with it, Buddha, but he, his origin is from the Shakya clan, of course, from the Shakya nation, right? City-state, you know. So Gautama, I once went there, and then he has a bunch of complaints about them. So, you know, he, they didn't offer me a seat. They were like rough and, rough and ready with me. So he accused them. And then, he, then Buddha says, so I'm, I'm skipping, though. I don't want to read every word. But Ambata, even the quail, can talk as she likes in her own nest. Kapilavatu is the second's home, Ambata. They do not deserve censure for such a trifle. And then he gives this thing. Gautama, there are four castes. Satya, Brahman, merchants, artisans. And of these four castes, three are entirely, the Kshatriya merchant and artisans are entirely subservient to the Brahmins. With regard to this, it is not proper, they should not pay homage to the Brahmins. So then the Lord thought, this young man, so Buddha actually can think, contrary to some people who think that if to get enlightened you have to cease thinking. Actually, Buddha's thinking right here in the Sutra. <laughs> ah, so, so in case you meditate a lot and you learn and you sort of, your thinking faculty gets somewhat paralyzed and you're kind of thinking, duh, you know, and you, you, have, you think you've achieved the alignment because you have quiet in your mind. Actually, you have like lost your human critical faculty and that's not a sign of being a Buddha at all. So he said, he thought, this young man goes too far in abusing the second. Supposing I were to ask after his clan name, so he said, Ambata, what is your clan? He says, I'm a Kanhayan, Reverend Gautama. Now, Kanha is Pali for Krishna, which means black, actually. So Ambata, in former days, according to those who remember the ancestral lineage, the Shakyans were the masters, and you are descended from a slave girl of the Shakyan. <laughs> Terrible. For the seconds regard King Okaka as their ancestor. And at one time, King Okaka, to whom his queen was dear and beloved, wishing to transfer the kingdom to her son, banished his elder brothers from the kingdom. Okamuka, Karandu, Hatiniya, and Sinipura. Because Buddha has memory of everybody's previous lives, so he can say this. And these being banished made their home on the bank of the Himalayas beside a lotus palm, where there was a big grove of teak trees. And for fear of contaminating the stock, they cohabited with their own sisters. Then King Okaka asked his ministers, where are the princes living now? And they told him, and then he told him, uh, they are strong as teak, these princes, they are real Sakyans. And that is how the Sakyans got their well-known name. Shakya means powerful. You know? And the king was the ancestor of the Shakyans. Now, King Okaka had a slave girl called Disa, who gave birth to a black child. The black thing, when it was born, exclaimed, Wash me, mother, bathe me, mother, deliver me from this dirt, and I will bring you profit. Because I'm Bata, just as people today use the term, this is a racist thing about India, I'm sorry, but this is what it, what it is. And he's just using this to quiet this guy down. Use the term hobgoblin as a term of abuse. It's not that Buddha is racist. So in those days, they said black, kanha. And they said as soon as he was born, he spoke, he was born a kanha, a goblin. And that is how in former days, the seconds were the masters, and you are descended from a slave girl of the seconds. On hearing this, the young men said, 
Reverend Gautama, do not humiliate Ambata too much with talk of his being descended from a slave girl. Ambata is well born, of good family, is very learned, he's well spoken, a scholar, well able to hold his own in his discussion with Reverend Gautama. In other words, he's a whitey. Then the Lord said to the young men, if you consider that Ambata is ill-born, not of a good family, unlearned, ill-spoken, no scholar, unable to hold his own in this discussion with the ascetic Gautama, then let Ambata be silent and you conduct this discussion with me. But if you think he's able to hold his own, then you be quiet and let him discuss with me. It's like, I'm telling you, but Ambata is well-born, Reverend Gautama, we'll be silent and he shall continue. Then he said to Ambata, I have a question for you which you will not like to answer. If you don't answer, evade the issue. If you keep silent or go away, your head will split into seven pieces. And that's a, that's a Vedic thing. It doesn't mean he's going to hit him in the head. But the, 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 it's a Vedic expression when you lose a debate about the Vedas or something that was already existing in the culture. That, you know, the sort of embarrassment and the humiliation of, of your mistaken knowledge is like your head splits apart type of thing, he says. So he says, what do you think, Ambata? Have you heard from old and venerable Brahmins, teachers of teachers, where the Kanhayans came from? Or who was their ancestor? At this time, Ambata remained silent. The Lord asked him a second time. Again, Ambata remained silent. And the Lord said, answer me now, Ambata. This is not a time for silence. Whoever Ambata does not answer a fundamental question put to him by a Tathagata, by the third asking, has his head split into seven pieces. At that moment, Vajrapani, the Yaksha, Yaksha means something like a, like a goblin or a troll or a, a, some kind of semi-ferocious um, forest creature, you know, like a, like a kind of spirit, let's say, Vajrapani, holding a huge iron club, flaming a blaze and glowing up in the sky just above Ambata was thinking. If this young man, Ambata, does not answer a proper question put to him by the blessed Lord by the third time of asking, I'll split his head into seven pieces. <laughs> the Lord saw Vajrapani, and so did Ambata. At that sight, Ambata was terrified and unnerved. His hair stood on end, and he sought protection, shelter, and safety from the Lord. So in other words, he saw the invisible security. <laughs> and, and he sought protection, shelter, and safety from the Lord, crouching down close to the Lord, that's the Buddha. He said, what did the Reverend Gautama say? May the Reverend Gautama repeat what he said. What do you think about, have you heard who the ancestors of the Kanhayans? Yes. Then he, re then he answers, yes, I have heard it just as the Reverend Gautama said. That is where the Kanhayans came from. He was their ancestor, King Okaka, and the, who married the slave girl. Hearing this, the young men had had a son by them, which was his ancestor. So the young men made a loud noise and clamor. So they said, so Ambata's ill-born, not of a good family, born of a slave girl of the seconds. The seconds are Ambata's masters. We disparaged the ascetic Gautama, thinking he was not speaking the truth. And then the Lord thought again, it is too much the way these young men humiliate Ambata for being the son of a slave girl. I must get him out of this. So he said to the young men, don't disparage Ambata too much for being the son of a slave girl. That Kanha was a mighty sage. He went to the south country, learned the mantras of the Brahmins there, then went to King Okaka and asked for his daughter, Madarupi. That Madarupi means intoxicating beauty. And King Okaka, furiously angry, exclaimed, so this fellow, the son of a slave girl, wants my daughter? And put an arrow to his bow, but he was unable either to shoot the arrow or to withdraw it. Then the ministers and counselors came to the sage Kanha and said, spare the king, sir, spare the king. Because like a great sage like that has the power to destroy a king, you know, their ideas. Oh, well, the king will be safe, but if he loses the arrow downwards, the earth will quake as far as his kingdom extends. But if he loses the arrow upward, the god will not let it rain for seven years. Spare the king. So they have this whole exchange. So in other words, he talks about how this Kanha, supposed the offspring of a slave girl and a king, was the supreme, the enlightened person, somewhat in the Brahmin sense of enlightenment. So then, then he said, suppose, Ambata, what do you think? Suppose a Kshatriya youth were to wed a Brahmin maiden and there was a son of the union. Would that son of a Kshatriya youth and a Brahmin maiden receive a seed and water from the Brahmins? He would, Reverend Gautama. Would they allow him to eat at funeral rites, at rice offering sacrifices at a guest? They would. Would they teach him mantras or not? They would. Would they keep their women covered or uncovered? Uh, but uh, covered, uncovered. In other words, they wouldn't be like uptight with him. Would the Kshatriya sprinkle him with the Kshatriya consecration? 
No, they wouldn't. Why not? Because he, because he is not well born from his mother's side. So he goes on with all different things about the whole, that this casting is very conventional, it's changeable. I, I'm not going to go on and on with it. But, you know, he completely humiliates or he humbles him about the idea that there's some super pure, super special thing that he was so stuck, stuck up with, that, that Ambata. And um, so he goes on and he basically comes to his point, which is, you can be a, a high person, an intellectual, a holy person, if you become a holy internally. It doesn't have to do with your birth and your clan, your caste, your color, any of this. It's a bunch of talk and conceit. But those who are enslaved by such things are far from the attainment of the unexcelled knowledge and conduct, that is, of wisdom and ethics, which is attained by abandoning all such things. And then finally, Ambata is humbled, so he listens. And he says, now there is such a great person in the world like me. And he's open about his own attainment. If the Tathagata arises in the world, and Arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, and Tao, wisdom, and contact, welfare, know the world's a common trainer, teacher of God's new, and enlightened and blessed. Having realized it by his own super knowledge, he proclaims this world with its gods, demons, and brahmas, its, princes, its creators, you could say, its princes and people. He preaches the Dhamma, which is lovely. You know, the same thing. Then they keep... Ref he gives the long speech that you had in the Samana Pala Sutta, the beautiful description of the different stages of contemplation, the different uh, and the magical powers of attaining the subtle body, and then Nirvana, right? He doesn't go into the formless realms. Remember, we read that last time. And those of you who weren't here last time, maybe you can find it online somehow. So, because I don't want to go back over it all. But it's annoying that it's not here, but it's referring to that sutta that we read. So then, and then he, uh, he, uh, he has a different definition of, of these failures and different Brahmins. And those Brahmins who just live and do rituals, he puts them down kind of. And he says, and they're not as great as the Brahmins who go out to be seekers and try to find out the nature of reality. And um, so he says, and then he puts them down because he's a, like a, 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 a temple Brahmin who just makes a living by doing rituals and he hasn't really sought out the nature of reality, he just memorized the Vedas. And he's like, not only you and your teacher are incapable of attaining this unexcelled knowledge and conduct, but of wisdom, and etc., but even the four paths of failure are beyond you. And yet you and your teacher, the Brahmin Pokarasati, utter these words, these shaven little seekers, menials, black scrapings from Brahma's foot, what converse can they have with Brahmins learned in the three Vedas? So anyway, this is the Buddha being a little spicy. And then later he goes to town and he meets the teacher himself. And he, has to, he humbles the teacher as well. And the teacher is sort of hip because he goes and he, 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 he looks and sees that the Buddha's body has these special marks which are in some sort of ancient scriptures. And, um, and he... You know, and this is, these are signs of the Buddha, odd signs of a perfect Buddha. There can be a Buddha in a lesser body, what's called an emanation body of, by, of incarnation. But what's called a supreme incarnation Buddha is this kind. And they have the tongue. And they can lick the ears with his tongue and cover the whole circle of his forehead with his tongue. He has one heavy-duty yogic tongue. <laughs> he can cover here and spread it out over like that. He can touch his ears with the tongue, you know. You know, there is a yoga lab. I have where they, the yogis can do this, and that little membrane underneath the tongue that holds it like that, they slowly erodes through some enzyme and something, and they can have it like, a, a regular yogis can do that, not only a Buddha, but a Buddha is particularly huge, the tongue, you know. And uh, then the other one is that the genitalia are like a horse or a, or a four-footed animal where it's sheathed, you know. The, the penis is sheathed. Normally, so he says, he, he, so, and so he created a, did a magical thing where the Ambata could see through his clothes and see his sheathed genitals, you see. And then sticking out his tongue, he reached out to lick his ears and nostrils and covered his forehead, just to show Ambata that yes, oh, he's got the 32 marks. Those are the most difficult ones. They have to do with things on the palm of the hands and the shape of the shoulders. That's quite elaborate. And they all come from former lives, evolutionary results, for example, of generosity, you have a hand that has like the membrane between the fingers, you know, which I have this tiny little membrane here, is much more extensive. It's almost like a webbed fingers and webbed toes if you're a Buddha. 
So like, presumably, you could hold more gifts to give to beings or something like that, because of vast generosity in previous life. It's a very funny idea, but it's very much there. They have this biological idea. And uh, so then uh, he shows that to Ambata, then he meets Pokharasati, and then Pokharasati has to shape up, and he gives a long talk to Pokharasati, and then sort of pretty much happy ending. And they're all happy with him, and they were everyone going to come and rise before him, well said Brahman, that's the end of it. So I just wanted to show this to show that he's kind of revolutionary in his social interactions with people. So I wanted to show that. Okay, so I read that sutra to show how the Buddha is. So Theravada itself is very, very revolutionary, and, um, but not as intense as the Mahayana. In other words, he doesn't tell these people, well, actually, you're already in Nirvana, so, you know, this take a break, you know. He doesn't tell them that because he knows that's too much for them. So he just goes, I want to just get that number. I'm going to show the next one, which is the Buddhist creation story. We skipped the first one, uh, which is quite lengthy about all the different wrong views or unrealistic worldviews. Um, but there's one thing in there I'll tell you about in the Brahma Jala Sutta, the network of Brahma, of all the 62 false views or false worldviews. And it shows how the Buddhist, Buddha's science works and what, how he sees things. He talks about one type of person who no matter what you do or say to him or what happens to him in his life as a human being, he will never give up the idea that there is a creator of the world, a, a, a monotheistic, omnipotent deity who created the world, but which they call Brahma, you know, the, the, the supreme Brahma, Brahma Shikin, the crown crest Brahma, you know. And, um, and, and his why will that person never give it up? And then he, he refers to the sutra we're going to read now, which is the Aganya Sutta, the Sutra of the Beginnings. And that Brahma, that, that human, was a Brahma in a particular universe, in a particular Big Bang, Big Crunch universe. He was the head god of that time. And when he was, and he came first into the world by himself, and he wondered where people, where was everybody? Like, where am I? You know, what am I doing here? Sort of thing. And then I wish there were, why aren't there some people here? He thought. And then there were lots of other gods here. They came by, they're born, the gods of that level are born, they say, born by apparition. They just pop, they just born. Or they sometimes translate spontaneously born. Or born from a lotus. They just boom are there. They don't have normal, like a human mammal or something. And so then that Brahma in that life, thought that his wish that there be beings here created the beings. So then when they said, Dada, you're the creator, he said, yeah, right, I created you. And he went through that whole long million, hundred million year, billion year lifetime as a Brahma, thinking he had created everything. So then he died, he went through many other things, then he became a human being. And in this life as a human being, you cannot convince him that there is not a creator of the universe. Now, I had read that sutra maybe 20 times in different classes. I never noticed that form of analysis, right? Like you go to a shrink, right? And you have a tick or something, or you have a problem with somebody. And, and they say, well, yeah, in your childhood, this and that happened to you. You know, and you don't remember, but you know, it influences your behavior. And often they are right. Some had some trauma or something, eventually you discover it. But the Buddhist thing, they, things happened to you in previous lives that, that uh, Buddha's clairvoyance, knowledge of previous lives, and not only Buddha, other enlightened beings can have that, the things happen to you there that, that affect you in this life. In other words, it's a much broader space of trauma, <laughs> in other words, than just your childhood as a human being in this life. And that, to me, is one of the most amazing things in that sutta that I really like. Now, I want to find out. I just forget the page number so I don't... This is the fun one where this monk called Kevada goes and sees that Brahma god, and that's a great one, but I, I'm going to skip that. I want to go to the Aganya Sutta. I decided that's the one I'm going to share with you. Here, Aganya Sutta, 407, okay. Don't watch or you'll get dizzy. Four thirty one. I think it must be this one. So this sutta, no, that's not in. Good, it's not that long, I forgot I wrote it. Yeah, here are knowledge of beginnings, aganya sutta, knowing of the beginnings. 
It is. And this is very, there's a wonderful author, if you're a serious scholar, called Stanley S.J. Tambaya, late S.J. Tambaya, who was an anthropologist, Sri Lankan Christian, actually, but a great anthropologist about Buddhism, until he got mad at this, the Buddhists in Sri Lanka for tor tormenting the Tamils. He was a Tamil. But he wrote some really fine books. And one of them is called World Conqueror and World Renouncer. And um, it's about uh, Buddhism, and it, and it uses this sutra as a very important, a very important um, document about sort of the nature of Buddhism as a social thing, you know. So, okay, so thus did I hear on a certain occasion that the Lord was staying at Shabasti, that's one of, the, one of his favorite places, at the mention of Migara's mother in the East Park. He wasn't staying in his favorite park, which was the uh, Jetavana at Savati, which was his favorite place, but somehow he was with Migara's mother in the East Park, in, its, in her grove, you know. At that time, uh, Basita and Bharadvaja were living among the monks, hoping to become monks and mendicants themselves. And evening, the Lord rose from his secluded meditation and came out of the mansion and started walking up and down in its shade. And they said, well, let us approach him. He's walking up and down. Maybe we'll ask some questions. So then he sits with them. And then he says, Vaseta, Vashishta, that is, you know, in Sanskrit. You two are Brahmins born and bred, and you have gone forth from the household life into homelessness from Brahmin families. Do not the Brahmins revile and abuse you? Indeed, Lord, the Brahmins do revile and abuse us. They don't hold back with their usual flood of reproaches, you know, for dropping out of the caste system, in other words. <coughs> Sorry. Well, but set down. What kind of reproaches do they fling at you? Lord, what the Brahmins say is this. The Brahmin caste is the highest caste. Other castes are base. The Brahmin caste is fair. Other castes are dark. Brahmins are purified. Non-Brahmins are not. The Brahmins are the true children of Brahma, born from his mouth, born of Brahma, created by Brahma, heirs of Brahma. That's the creator, right? And you, you have deserted the highest class and gone over to the base class of shaveling, petty ascetics, servants, dark fellows, born of Brahma's foot. It is not right, it is not proper for you to mix with such people. That is the way the Brahmins abuse us, Lord. Then Vasetta, the Brahmins have forgotten their ancient tradition when they say that because we can see Brahmin women, the wives of Brahmins who menstruate and become pregnant, have babies and give suck. And yet these womb-born Brahmins talk about being born from Brahma's mouth. These Brahmins misrepresent Brahma, tell lies, and earn much demerit. There are Vasetta, these four castes. So you know, those Brahmins are like those creationists you know, who think that they have this thing of, of uh, Adam in San Diego, they have a big, uh, what do you call it, diorama. And they have Adam 5,000 years ago lying, or 6,000 years ago lying on the earth in Kenya. And he has reddish blonde hair and beard, and he's lying on his side like this, and he was just created straight by God, you know. I mean, really, you know. So just these ancient Brahmins were like that thousands of years ago in India, Buddhas, and Buddhas critiquing them just like a scientist would do today, just the same, in a way. Although his, 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 where he ends up is a little more complicated. And sometimes, uh, so anyway, they're these different castes, they sometimes do bad things and immoral, and so they're unfitting for a noble one. He's saying Arya, and that's wrong, he should say a noble person and considered so, and they have a, they're dark with a dark result, blamed by the wise, sometimes to be found among the warriors, and the same applies to Brahmins and merchants and artisans. Sometimes they can be criminals. And sometimes such a warrior refrains from taking a life, is not grasping, malicious, or have wrong worldviews, unrealistic worldviews. Such things as are moral and considered so, blameless or considered so, are ways of befitting a noble one, and considered so, bright with bright results, and praised by the wise, and sometimes to be found among the Kshatriyas and likewise among Brahmins, merchants, and artisans. Now, since both dark and bright qualities which are blamed and praised by the wise are scattered indiscriminately among the four cows, the wise do not recognize the claim about the Brahmin cows being the highest and wise that. Because they, but said that anyone from the four cows who becomes a mendicant, a, a saint who has destroyed the corruptions, who has lived the life, done what has to be done, laid down the burden, reached the highest goal, destroyed the fetter of becoming and become emancipated through super-knowledge, he 
or she is proclaimed supreme by virtue of the Dharma and not the non-Dharma. So Dharma is the best thing for people in this life and the next as well. So here he goes on with that and, uh, and, uh, and uh, he talks about uh, the king serves Gotama, and he pays the king serves we well and considers a saintly person like myself or like the, the enlightened students of mine, mendicants. Uh, so therefore, uh, the, the, the Buddha, an enlightened person, can say, I'm born of the Dharma, created by the Dharma, heir of the Dharma. Because this designates the Takagata, the body of Dharma. This is the body of Brahma, become Dharma, become Brahma, blah, blah, blah. So he, he says, he changes the hierarchy and he says, enlightened persons are noble. Like he, I think I told you in the earlier class that word Arya, which meant noble. He redefines his meaning a person who is less egotistical is, becomes noble. And that's the one who becomes honorable and not someone by, by birth, in other words. And that's his main point. Now, he says, now, there comes a time when sooner or later, now he gives a cosmogony, and this is what I wanted to read to you, a sattā, when sooner or later, after a long period, this world contracts. At a time of contraction, beings are mostly born in the Abhasvara Brahma world. So, in other words, your beginningless life, or our beginningless lives as humans, but previous lives are beginningless. But there were times when the world frame, you know, the planets or whatever they had, the planet, the single planet that they had in the old cosmology, uh, is destroyed. But the universe is not destroyed. And so at a subtle plane of the, one of the higher 16 levels of the Brahma-bodied worlds, where beings had just have big energy bodies, they kind of float in the, in the energy field, they don't need planets and earth and things like that. And that's where we were in those times, because we have been beginningless in life. There are no animals, there's no hells, and everyone, everyone becomes such a kind of being, a kind of divine being in this sort of thing. See, there they dwell, mind-made, feeding on delight, self-luminous, moving through the air, glorious, and they stay like that for a very long time, like billions and billions of years, actually. They have numbers, actually, the ancient cosmogonists for this. But sooner or later, after a very long period, this world begins to expand again. At a time of expansion, the beings from the Abhasara Brahma world, having passed away from there, are mostly reborn in this world. Here they dwell, at first mind-made, feeding on, like with a subtle body in other words, feeding on delight, self-luminous, moving through the air, glorious, and they stay like that for a very long time. At that period, Vesata, there was just one mass of water, and all was darkness. Isn't that interesting? Think of Genesis. Blinding darkness. Neither moon nor sun appeared. No constellation nor stars appeared. Night and day were not distinguished. Nor months and fortnights, nor years or seasons, and no male and female. Beings being reckoned just as beings. And sooner or later, after a very long period of time, savory earth spread over the waters where those beings were. It looked just like the skin that forms itself over hot milk as it cools. It was endowed with color, smell, and taste. It was the color of fine ghee or butter, and it was very sweet, like pure wild honey. Then some being of a greedy nature said, I say, what can this be? And tasted the savory earth on its finger. In so doing, it became taken with the flavor and craving arose in it. Then other beings taking their cue from that one also tasted the stuff. Then they too were taken with the flavor and craving arose. So they set to with their hands, breaking off pieces of the stuff in order to eat it. And the result of this was that their self-luminance disappeared. And as a result of the disappearance of their self-luminance, the moon and the sun appeared, night and day were distinguished, months and fortnights appeared, and the year and its season, to that extent, the world re-evolved. And those beings continued for a very long time, feasting on this savory earth, feeding on it, being nourished by it. And as they did so, their bodies became coarser, and a difference in looks developed among them, some beings became good-looking, others ugly, and the good-looking ones despised the others, saying, we're better looking than they are. And because they became arrogant and conceited about their looks, the savory earth disappeared. At this, they, became to, they came together and lamented, crying, oh, that flavor, oh, that flavor. And so nowadays, when people say, oh, that flavor, when they get something nice, they're repeating an ancient saying, I'm realizing it. And then when the savory earth had disappeared, a fungus cropped up in the manner of a mushroom. 
It was of a good color, smell, and taste. It was the color of fine ghee or butter. It was very sweet, like pure wild honey. And it was being set to an ate the fungus. And this lasted. And it goes on about the mushrooms, you know. Then creepers appeared, shooting up like bamboo, and they were sweet. And they set to and fed on them. And then, and then, but then these creepers disappeared when they, they got more and more arrogant. And then they said, oh, no, and then what have we lost? What have we lost? Then, they, then rice appeared in open spaces, free from powder and from husk, fragrant and clean grain. And when they had taken it in the evening for supper and grown again, it was ripe in the morning. And what they took in the morning for breakfast was ripe again by evening with no sign of reaping, and etc. So it gets worse and worse. Then, and as they did so, their bodies became coarser still, and the difference in their looks became even greater. And the females developed female sex organs, and the males developed male organs. And the women became excessively preoccupied with men, and the men excessively preoccupied with women. Owing to this excessive preoccupation with each other, passion was aroused, and their bodies burnt with lust. And later, because of this burning, they indulged in sexual activity. But those who saw them indulging threw dust, ashes, or cow dung at them, crying. Apparently there were cows there, too. <laughs> Die, you filthy beast! How can you do such thing, one thing to such another? And just as today in some district when a daughter-in-law is led out, some people throw dirt at her, some ashes and some cow dung, without realizing that they are repeating an ancient observance. What was considered bad form in those days is now considered good form. And then he goes on and on with that. And then, finally, they, the, the earth starts, stops producing spontaneous rice. And then they have to plant it. I, I'm going to cut to the chase here a little bit. And it keeps getting worse and worse. And then finally they start hoarding the rice, then they steal it from each other, then they finally appoint a policeman to protect them from each other. And that's the, sort, that's the origin of kingship. So a kingship doesn't come from the arms of God, it becomes as a protection racket, you know, where they... And therefore, he says, if, they, if a king doesn't protect them from each other and starts to oppress them, they should throw them out. So it's sort of Buddhist, Buddhist theory of revolution, actually. And the people's choice is the meaning of Mahasamatha, the, the great elected one. It's the name of the, of the first king. Mahasamatha means, you know, totally appointed or by the people, Mahasamatha. And he goes on like that. And, uh, and so then, he, uh, then they settle and they do all this. And um, they have different trades and they have different classes. And then, they, and then, um, then some beings went on hunting, and, they, and that's what Shudra originally means. And that's why people didn't like them, but they did like the game that they brought to eat and so forth, but they put, made them lower caste and so on. So he, so he completely creates a cosmogony parallel to, the, parallel to, the, to, to any kind of cosmogony, but in which the, he, he relativizes the whole caste system, in other words. And, he, and he, in, an other, in another sutra, he relativizes the role of Brahma, God, as I think I told you where in the Kevada Sutta, where the, the guy asked Brahma, how did you create the world and how does it work? And Brahma finally admits to him that he didn't create it, doesn't know how it works, and he just was the first being who came when the world revolved down out of the Abhasara heaven. And so he was all alone in the world. And he doesn't elaborate that. I actually forgot that. I thought that was also in this sutra. But that's in the Kevara Sutta. So, the, so the, he has that kind of a critique of the, of the, um, of the, you know, the, you know, monotheistic idea of a creator God. He critiques that. Doesn't blame any one being for the creation of the mess, you know. And Brahma likes that. And Brahma actually asks the Buddha, when he becomes enlightened, to teach people, um, to teach people that he's not omnipotent, and therefore, when terrible things happen to them. They shouldn't blame him, because he didn't make cause that to them. Now I want to read another one to you, so you can meditate a little bit. Satipatthana, 335. So that's, that's a cosmogony that he teaches, and it's kind of fun, actually. And um, the, uh, the, the, that great book, World Conquered, World Renouncer, talks about how that sutta became so important, and under the Emperor Ashoka, he, um, this one, under the Emperor Ashoka, uh, emperor, although he was an emperor and he united many city-states, or he, he controlled the union of many city-states that had happened for over a couple of centuries after Buddha's time, 
uh, he, uh, his grandfather, Ashoka's grandfather, was the one who fought off Alexander the Great and the Greeks and pushed them back west of the Indus. And um, uh, although the Greeks then hung out in Afghanistan and what is now western Pakistan and eastern Iran, but uh, he did push them away from, from main heartland India. And then in doing so, he made an empire because he united the city-states to, um, to repel Alexander. Right? And, then, and then Ashoka became emperor. And then the sutra meant that Ashoka had felt that he was not born of the arms of God and it created the new version of kingship in India from the fourth century before the common era, 200 years after Buddha's time, I think. Some people nowadays think only 140, 150, they move Buddha later. Western scholars, or European scholars particularly, are very anxious to make Buddha more late. They don't like that Buddha was 500 years before Jesus. <laughs> they don't. Makes them nervous, so they keep trying to push his date down. But I think around 6th century, actually, myself. But they, they have some evidence, some Pali texts or something that, uh, that the history is, you know, that they think are reliable. Anyway, so, uh, so that sutta, by relativizing kingship, then created the idea that Ashoka initiated for a huge sponsorship of Buddhism, of the Sangha, the community, himself kind of converted from his warrior conquering form to nonviolence, writing it up on stone pillars so you know a historian can miss it, and, um, and acting like he's the parent of the subjects, and he's like a caring parent over the subjects, no longer like the Vedic gods who were like fierce, to be propitiated through the rituals who were frightening and really changed the attitude of the people, began to create a, a, a context where people's attitude toward authority became less frightened of authority. And the, and the idea of the king as loving the subjects got to be kind of an idea, which was there was no idea of God loving you in the Vedic thing. God sort of would be all right with you if you did the right rituals. But they, there was no idea that God loved the humans. That God looked down in a negative way about the humans. But from Ashoka's time, in the social structure, it emerged that the idea of the king loved you. And also the old theory in the Mahabharata of kingship was that the king could do no wrong, kill anybody he wanted. He was guarding everybody so nobody could stop him type of thing. And because he was the arms of God, you know. Whereas after Ashoka and after this sutta permeated, percolated through the society, the idea was the king also had to protect people. If he pressed them, then he, they, he was an unjust king and they could get rid of him. But there's no, they didn't really do that much. Uh, but they had councils of elders who would somewhat do that. But, uh, but anyway, that's a very important thing. Okay, any questions about any of that? Anybody have? I want to check time. Yeah, good. So we're going to do some meditating now. Mindfulness meditating. Unless you have some questions about what we've discussed. So far, and I'm sorry, some of you here were not here when I read the Manapala, which was kind of preliminary to what we discussed tonight. But um, so I, I, I will put it up, I will send it to Rebecca and they will put it up somewhere online. And I don't know, Rebecca. By the way, someone asked me, could they look at last year's things? Are these available now? Have we got them? What? I didn't hear yes or no. Uh, they are available for members on the online library. So yes, they are available if you're a member on our website. So there is a way of getting to them. Okay, good. Reasonably, yeah, sure. Okay, good. Because someone asked me that. Remember um, our friend? Uh, yes, she asked. And I wasn't sure what to answer. Yes. I, um, I just wanted to mention that it's using Google it's quite easy to find this PDF online. It's what? It's easy to get the file online using Google. Oh, really? I, yeah, I was able to find it without any trouble oh, whatsoever. Great. The and file of the long discourses? This, yeah, this one. Really? So if you don't want to put the whole file up, you could just send the link to the class and they could get it that way. Oh, great. There, there are three so I don't want to send the whole book, but I thought I would send no. the Samanapala because it's so important. I but, have that in a separate PDF. But there are three or four places where it can be found without oh, trouble. Oh, great. Thank you. It's hard on publishers. Google is really hard on publishers. <laughs> but that's too bad. I paid for mine. What? I paid for mine. Yeah. I used books for mine. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, this is this is a nice book. Okay. Although I'm 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 I don't think any of them still are rightly translated, as you can tell, as I'm saying. Not quite yet, because there isn't yet uh, in our culture, and that was an Englishman who did that, and and the British or our culture, there's still not yet a really, real true respect for the Asian thing. Not really. A few exceptional people, but as a whole, there isn't. They still know. They think there's some backward people. They're underdeveloped, right? Backward. You know, we're developed and forward. It's just, <laughs> it's just sort of it's not quite clicking with people that we're within this very short time of destroying the whole place, which is not really the act of an advanced civilization. It's because it's self-destructive. You know. I was so shocked. Not long ago, I was, uh, on some documentary of the foremost American academic expert about the uh, melting glaciers in Greenland. <clears throat> and uh, he, he did a very, he probably has done something since then, but he went a team and they made big measurements in 2014. And they had done, a, had a previous big, huge expedition to measuring in 2009. And in that five years, he said in that documentary, which I saw in 2015, he said that in those five years, the, Green, the condition of the Greenland glacier had reached what they predicted in 2009 as the worst case analysis in 2059, in five years. So 10 times faster than they predicted by their scientific measurement and expectation. So in that case, I don't think we can really be like, you know, they always say it's like the frog, you know, who slowly boils to death and doesn't know that they're boiling, you know, the human race is, you know, in this. But since it's accelerating so hugely, it isn't going to be 2100 or, you know, that, that we're going to have this major catastrophe. We're having them already, really. Anyway, 95 degrees, September 14th, 2016 in New York City. Anyway, never mind all that cosmology and cosmogony and the Buddha's grumpy personality, <laughs> which I, I find endearing myself. Okay, so once the Lord was staying among the Kurus, and they were in this place, you know, never mind, I'm, and, they, he, and he addressed the mendicants, he said, mendicants, and they said, Lord, and he said, there is mendicants, this one way to the purification of beings for the overcoming of sorrow and distress, for the disappearance of pain and sadness, for the gaining of the right path, for the realization of Nibbana. That is to say, the four foundations of mindfulness. Does this sound like Barry to you all? Does it sound like the mindfulness craze? It does. And it is, actually. This is a source, you know. That's why I wanted to read it to you, and we're going to meditate a little bit, just on the beginning of it. We'll come back to it then next week. What are the four? Actually, I don't like the, tr the translation foundation. It's, a, it's smrti upastana or satipatana. And the patana part means a place. But the upa means close place. The stana, tana by itself means place. Patana in Sanskrit, upastana. So smrti upastana. So it means a close place. So it doesn't really mean a basis or foundation. It means a focus of mindfulness. It's where you put mindfulness rather than a foundation of mindfulness. You follow me? But everyone, this has become standard from the thing. They say foundation of mind because they say upastana is a place. They ignore what the prefix upa means. And they think, well, the close place well, it must be foundation. And then that's just everybody's been stuck with that. But actually, it means where you place your mindfulness. It doesn't mean where mindfulness is placed. You follow me? Where it's based. It means what you're putting it. Right? It's based in your consciousness, of course, not on these places. Anyway. So the four foci. I, chose, I like the, the four foci of mindfulness, where you focus mindfulness. What are the four? Here, a mendicant's. A mendicant abides contemplating body as body, ardent, clearly aware, and mindful, having put aside hankering and fretting for the world. He abides contemplating feelings as feelings. He, and then they repeat those phrases, but he, that's what dot, dot, dot means. He abides contemplating mind as mind, and he abides contemplating mind objects as mind objects, ardent, clearly aware, and mindful, having put aside hankering and fretting for the world. Okay? 
So, so that's where, so the four foci, you focus on the body, you focus on the sensations actually. Feelings as emotions you do not focus on. Sensations. Then mind, then you get at emotions. And then mind objects, you also get at content of mind. So I, they again also insist on translating Vedana as feelings, which in English can mean emotion as well as a sensation of pleasure and pain. But they mean mainly sensation of pleasure and pain. So I don't know why they just stuck on this, people. Anyway, now a mendicant. How does a mendicant abide contemplating the body as body? And now like, I'd like you to meditate. Everyone, let's all meditate together and I'll read slowly. Here a mendicant, having gone into the forest or to the root of a tree or to an empty place or to a Tibet house or to the internet, sits down cross-legged holding his or her body erect, having established mindfulness before him. Now, by the way, mindfulness, let's, the word that is translated mindfulness is actually sati in Pali and smriti in Sanskrit. And smriti means memory, remembrance, actually, is a better, is a more literal translation of, of sati or smriti. So what is interesting is that our memory, uh, you know, the consciousness we have when we remember something, like I remember what happened this morning, then sort of my mind goes to some experience in the past. And a lot of the time when we're doing, sitting here or doing things, going somewhere, walking, we're remembering things that happen. So our mind is meandering around our past experience. So why they translate this mindfulness, which is not totally bad, but why they translate it mindfulness is that they mean that instead of letting the mind wander toward memories, you're remembering that you're here. So you're sort of doubling up your awareness of being here by taking the memory away from meandering around in the past. And that's the most important, apparently we spend a lot of time remembering, according to their psychological observation. We're also, of course, taking away our fantasy, anticipating different future situations. But apparently more of our mind is stuck in meandering and reminiscing and being bitter and annoyed or being happy or lamenting the loss of, or whatever it is. It's a lot of division of our awareness where we have remembering other things while we're presently here. So we're not, we're not, we don't have our full awareness of being here. So for example, uh, if any of you ever heard of Gurdjieff or Uspensky or these people, Gurdjieff was teaching mindfulness actually. And Uspensky wrote this whole book about, called In Search of the Miraculous, which was, and the main practice that he taught was called self-remembering. And that, in a way, is the most better translation of, of sati, self-remembering, in the sense of remembering what, what's going on right now, taking away that memory from, from your images of past things and from your anticipations of future things. So intensifying your sense of presence. Okay? That's, that's what it is. So I don't know if mindfulness long run, whether we stick with that word, you know, the culture will, as this becomes part of the more and more long-term part of the culture. I don't know. I don't know if anybody has suggestions of what, what, what how you, self-remembering, you know, which is, it sounds a little technical and you can't really have like the self-remembering craze. <laughs> Gurdjieff never really succeeded in making it a craze, although it was considered the work of consciousness, self-remembering. But that's what he taught as his basic practice. Okay, so having established mindfulness before him, that is to say, and establishing it before him, like what, you put it in front of you? No, I, I'm not sure actually. I have to look that up exactly how that is, why he puts it like that. But making it his main concern, I think really is what it means. So mindfully he breathes in and mindfully he breathes out. So that means remembering that he's breathing as he breathes and remembering he breathes out as he breathes. So please do that now yourselves, okay? Breathing in a long breath. She knows that she breathes in a long breath and breathing out a long breath. She knows that she breathes out a long breath.
If you, how many of you have never tried this, by the way? Any of you, have any of you never tried this before? Oh good, you're all, oh good, you're all veteran mindfulness practice. Very good. Oh, you, you haven't? So try it. The thing, the thing there is, when you do that, you realize that, uh, that your mind will start producing dialogue, or monologue, whatever you want to call it, about, like, why am I doing this? Instead of just being aware of your in-breathing and out-breathing and remembering that now I, this is happening without even labeling it, but just being just totally aware of just the breathing without thinking anything other thing, without your consciousness dividing, your awareness dividing in any way. So you're remembering what's happening now. Sometimes there are shows where you label in order to try to focus down because your mind, when it wanders, is yapping about other things. But uh, most imp you know, the goal is to be able to just breathe, be fully aware of the breathing, and not think anything else other than the breathing. Retrieving your memory energy and your anticipating energy. Breathing in a short breath, he knows that he breathes in a short breath. And breathing out a short breath, he knows that he breathes out a short breath. And here you notice, when you do remember that you're just breathing, it's very hard to breathe naturally. You sort of automatically start either taking an extra deep breath, or you a little bit speed up your breathing, because you're somehow aligning your awareness with your breathing, which normally happens automatically and you pay no attention to it. Right, because you're thinking about, or you're looking at, or you're having a sense experience of some other kind. He trains himself thinking, I will breathe in, uh, conscious of the whole body. That in, in itself is very difficult. As you breathe in, you do what Johnny Cabot's in calls a body scan. Oh, not quite, you don't go from toe to head but you sort of feel as if whatever you're getting out of the breathing, like the energy, is kind of diffusing everywhere into the body. So in a way, you're kind of, without necessarily thinking about it, you're following the oxygen getting into the bloodstream and then going out to the extremities and flushing out any, like, carbon and bring it back up to the lungs and having that flushed out in the exhalation. But you're doing it on the basis of sort of a sensation of having a body. The, the thing that is used in mindfulness practice of counting the breath from one to ten, the counting part is only because at least you're trying to unify the distracting thoughts into just the number, into just tracking the number of the breaths. Ideally, you would just remember the breaths and not count, not have to count eventually, but for the time being, you, you are using the counting as a sort of thread to return to when you catch yourself thinking something else and you then discard that process of thinking and come back to remembering the breathing.
actually very restful to just breathe and not follow any other train of thought. He trains himself thinking, I will breathe out, conscious of the whole body. She trains herself thinking, I will breathe in, calming the whole bodily process. She trains herself thinking, I will breathe out, calming the whole bodily process. just as a skilled turner or his assistant in making a long turn knows that he is making a long turn or in making a short turn knows that he is making a short turn, so too a monk in breathing in a long breath, a mendicant in breathing in a long breath, knows that he breathes in a long breath and so trains himself thinking, I will breathe out calming the whole bodily process. So I can sense you're all very good at that. You can do that. Uh, then anyone new is noticing how they keep thinking about what they're doing in commenting kind of to themselves and questioning to themselves and and so on and then sort of thinking maybe I shouldn't do that and I should just remember the breathing and even that is something distracting etc so then to get to quieting these secondary distractions they realize that that's a kind of thing that takes time to do and of course it's the basis of being able to really concentrate on something in the Eightfold Path of the Four Noble Truths, this practice is the seventh one. It's not the first one, it's the seventh one. And it precedes samadhi, which means concentration. You know, real intense one-pointed concentration. So that is in a way part of its goal. But this breathing thing is just the very beginning of it, I should say. Okay, ding. Now we can follow a little, little more. So she abides. The reason I say he and she and alternate is that in Sanskrit and Pali, the grammarians say that the, since it's a gendered language, they say that the masculine case stands for both. You know, like in English, we have the word mankind or man, and it's supposed to include both. Although uh, people who are more conscious nowadays, like, like I, for example, I like to write humankind. I prefer to write. <clears throat> Some people do. Some people say, oh, well, we'll just go with the convention or something. And then some people, you know, whatever. Feminists do something else. So he abides contemplating body as body internally, which is what you do when you feel your breath is filling the whole body. Contemplating body as body externally is what you do when you sort of, you know, you re remember a image of your whole body. Contemplating body as body both internally and externally. She abides contemplating arising phenomena in the body. She abides contemplating vanishing phenomena in the body. 
So, you know, things that, you know, you know, when you're breathing, then you sort of notice the breath at the nostrils, or you notice the swelling of the abdomen or the, of the chest, and then the feeling of energy in the limbs. So these are phenomena, and you notice that they come and go, you know. So that's a little hint about impermanence or changeability, you know. Or else mindfulness that there is body is present, present to him just to the extent necessary for knowledge and awareness. So the label, there is body, or this my body, or something like that, uh, it's like tatkaya, or something like that. It simply means that body, or this body, tatkaya. Uh, it's the, the only to the extent necessary for knowledge and awareness. In other words, you're not, the labeling, you're not to intensify, or something, or feel that that's, you know, you, he, they're acknowledging that there's a tendency to label you know, verbally, but they're just saying you should make it just necessary, just, just a little bit, not strongly. And he abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. And that, monks, is mendicants, is how a mendicant abides contemplating body as body. Again, a mendicant, when walking, knows that he is walking, when standing, knows that he is standing, when sitting, knows that he is sitting, when lying down, knows that he is lying down. In whatever way his body is disposed, he knows that that is how it is. So, he abides, so she abides contemplating body as body internally, externally, and both internally and externally. And she abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. And that monks is how a mendicant abides contemplating body as body. Again, a mendicant, when going forward or back, is clearly aware of what he is doing. In looking forward or back, he's clearly aware of what he is doing. In bending and stretching, he is clearly aware of what he is doing. In carrying his inner and outer robe in his bowl, he is clearly aware of what he is doing. In eating, drinking, chewing, and savoring, he is clearly aware of what he is doing. In passing excrement or urine, he is clearly aware of what he is doing. In walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, and waking up, in speaking or in staying silent, he is clearly aware of what he is doing. So she abides contemplating body as body internally, externally, and both internally and externally. And she abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world, and that mendicant is how a mendicant abides contemplating body as body. So right there, you know, that's like Thich Nhat Han, that's like the men mindfulness centers. Really, the, almost the whole entire work that people do there is this. It's just this first four sections of this sutra. Uh, the, this, this is just really the focus on the body, and the breath is part of it. There's one element in the body, right? That's what it's about. And this, of course, is not specific only to the, to the Theravada. This, everyone does this. All the Mahayana practitioners have to learn this as well. Four Noble Truths, they have to learn. Now here we get the body scan. And this, I'm just reading, this is I think the last thing I'll read tonight. Here we get the body scan. Let's see, again, a mendicant reviews this very body from the soul. So this people really don't do exactly very much. Because then this is judgmental, in other words. You know, you hear the slogan that all the self-awareness and this body awareness and this mindfulness is non-judgmental. But this is judgmental, as you can see. Again, a monk reviews this very body from the soles of the feet upwards and from the scalp downwards, enclosed by the skin and full of manifold impurities. In this body, there are head hairs, body hairs. This one, maybe you can meditate again. Go back to meditation mode. I'm being a little mischievous here, but try. Go back to meditation mode and scan the body like in this way, following this text. Again, a monk reviews, a mendicant, she or he, reviews this very body from the soles of the feet upward and from the scalp downwards, enclosed by the skin and full of manifold impurities. In this body, there are head hairs, 
body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, pleura, spleen, lungs, mesentery, bowels, stomach, excrement, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, tallow, saliva, snot, synovic fluid, urine. Just as if there were a bag open at both ends, full of various kinds of grain, such as hill rice, paddy, green gram, kidney beans, sesame, husk rice, and a man with good eyesight were to open the bag and examine them, saying, this is hill rice, this is paddy, this is green gram, these are kidney beans, this is sesame, this is husk rice. So too a mendicant reviews this very body. In this body, there are head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, pleura, spleen, lungs, mesentery, I don't know the word, bowels, stomach, excrement, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, tallow, saliva, snot, synovic fluid, urine. So she abides contemplating body as body internally, externally, and both internally and externally. And he abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. And that mendicants is how a mendicant abides contemplating body as body. So, so when you inventory the body like that, and this happens very directly in the sutra. They don't spend a month on just following the breath. But they go into sort of reviewing, reviewing the reality of themselves. And this is the beginning of an intensive, what I call a deglamorizing process, where one seeks to become aware of, to remember the reality of the physical vehicle, so to speak. And uh, as we continue in the sutra, which we will do next time, we will um, see how you sort of keep cross-cutting it and cross-hatching it and going deeper and deeper and more and more subtle. And, uh, and intending to develop a kind of lack of narcissism about the body, I right, basically realize. A deglamorization of it. Which is very intense. Of course, these are mendicants, they're celibate, and uh, they are seeking to overcome craving. And uh, the first place to start is about oneself, you know to realize, you know, what one is, to become aware of it, to remem remember it, to be mindful of it. So, okay, I think we more or less reached the point tonight. I usually over overrun everything. I think the third time, next time, we will continue with this sutra, but I think also I feel a need to go over the Four Noble Truths as the basis of all of the Buddhist teachings. So there's, I'll do the sutra on the Four Truths. Maybe I should have done that today, too. But I'll do that next time. And um, 
we are getting, getting a flavor of the Buddha's world, you know, somehow. And especially in the other one, we got the flavor of the Buddha's presence, I hope. That's what one... And, and uh, this is a little grim, really, this sutra, that's why I'm almost regretting doing it. It's a little grim being self, doing self-remembering, if that's what mindfulness really is. Uh, being really inventory and really remembering, what, seeing oneself from all different kinds of ways, you know, becoming much more self-aware. And if you ever read, any of you ever read Uspensky's book, it's, it's a very powerful method, actually, to keep to even at all times. Although it ha- there is a little bit of a drawback. I used to, I know quite a few people who were serious Gurdjieffians in the past. And when you chat with them or something, especially the, not the veterans, but the beginners, there's almost three people present. There's you and the person you're talking to, and then there's somebody observing them both from above which is the kind of self-awareness consciousness that they develop. Like a second view of the self or something like that from another point, a vantage point, you know. And mindfulness people can become, when you, if you practice mindfulness a lot, you can become sort of very self-conscious because that's the whole point. Mindfulness practice is self-consciousness practice. So it, it becomes a little, that's why when the mendicants would do it, they would join the order. They would not want to be distracted by having a profession, having to type, having to cut shoes, having to grow food, or having to do rituals, or, or whatever it is, you know, make judgments in a court. In other words, they would want to be really become fully aware of their presence as a human being and what it really involves. So then naturally they want to be, only do that all the time. And they want to have a lifestyle where they're supported just to do that. And the society had the generosity to want them to be able to do that. So they all had scholarships. Pretty much, like, especially in the Buddha's time, that like masses of them just joined this thing. You know. And women especially. That's why he was reluctant to allow women to, to join their, their own female mendicant order. Because he knew there would be such a rush. Because they're so advanced, actually, rather than the guys. You know. But anyway, I don't want to run over the time. So that's it for tonight. Thank you very much. Okay? All the best.